Grace to you and peace from God our Creator, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. O oh Lord, we pray, speak in this place, in the calming of our minds and in the longing of our hearts, by the words of my lips and in the thoughts that we form. Speak, O oh Lord, for your servants listen. Amen. Continuing our epiphany theme of how God's Spirit is active in our lives, today we focus on God's Spirit of humility. Here again what St. Paul wrote. Consider your call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards, nor were many powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. Consider your call, he says. I echo those words. Consider your call. Consider who you were and who you are. Within the structure of the Lutheran Church, we speak about pastors receiving a call to ministry. Now that comes in two forms. One is the call from a congregation, which is in essence an invitation to the pastor to come and be their pastor. But long before that moment ever occurs, there is the call from God, where the pastor feels without doubt, well, maybe a little, that he or she has been invited by God to serve as one of God's shepherds and to care for God's sheep. Now, you may think to yourself, you're not qualified to receive a call from God. You may feel you don't have any skills or abilities to serve the church. I'm not an eloquent public speaker, you might say. I'm uncomfortable going up to people and talking to them about my faith. I don't know a whole lot of Bible verses. Oh God, if they ask me questions, I'm going to feel so scared. Consider these words. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. God didn't choose you because of your high qualifications, but rather His. He didn't choose you because of your talents and abilities. He chose you because of the gifts He was planning to give you. You've heard me say many times before, God doesn't call the qualified to ministry. Rather, God qualifies those whom he has called. God has chosen to do a confounding thing by picking you for ministry. You might think to yourself, who, me? Well, guess what? I feel the same way. God picked me, smart-out kid from New York City, whose dreams were to be a professional baseball player, despite a profound lack of ability, to serve God in the kingdom, to be his messenger. We've talked amongst ourselves about times when I have been called to be there for someone in a time of crisis. And you would think that perhaps I might be anxious in those moments, wondering what I'm going to say. I don't know what to tell these people. Well, guess what? That's my prayer at that time. Oh, Lord, I don't know what to say to these people. Use me. And in every single instance, God has given me words to say. Sometimes it's no words at all. Just sit silently and be sad with them. But in the same way, God has chosen you 
to be his messenger and spokesperson throughout each day of your life. You may never be called to sit at the bedside of a dying individual and share words of comfort or hope. But each and every day, each and every one of you crosses paths with someone who needs to hear what you have to say. And they'll probably hear it better coming from you than they would from me. You're a student, right? You're not a student. Okay, but you've been to school. Okay, good. Because otherwise this illustration goes nowhere if you like you know brought up in a basement and, and, and never brought up into the outside world until this morning. I teach high school. And sometimes the students don't get what I'm saying. And I might try a couple of times to share with somebody like Santiago what the lesson is supposed to be, but man, I just can't get through to him. You know how he is. Typically what I'll do for little Santiago who sits there in my class and can't understand what I'm trying to teach is to get another student to share it with you. Because typically one student can talk to another in a language and in a way that I can't. Makes sense, right? Okay. Well, you've all been called to be evangelists. You've all been called to share the gospel. And God's not asking you to do it like I do. God's not asking you to do it like St. Paul or St. Peter, he's asking you to do it like you do. Because you have been chosen. You with all your worries and anxieties about the future. You with your great school education. You with your bad back and your aching neck and feet. You with your private thoughts and your secret past. You with your desperate needs and your hidden fears. Just as so long ago, Jesus chose Peter with all his bull-headed, stubborn bravado, or Matthew with his unsavory background as a tax collector, or Simon, the zealot, the political radical, or James and John, fishermen with a strange ambition to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. Or Paul, who set out to destroy the Christians and wound up being their greatest missionary. The Lord chose nobodies to be the leaders of his new church, the first to witness the miracles, the first to spread the good news about what Jesus had said and done. We all look for wholeness. We all look for salvation. Some look to God, but not all. Some look to other things in this world. They look for better jobs, bigger paychecks, more interesting hobbies, different marriage partners. And while all these things have the appearance of wisdom, and may even turn out to be good by earthly standards, they don't save. And the happiness they offer does not bring blessing. In Corinth, the church was divided because people picked one individual or another as their spiritual leader rather than Christ being the center of the wheel. Or they argued over who had what gift instead of being thankful that God had blessed them. They argued about everything, as a matter of fact. Sounds a whole lot like the church today. I've got an individual that I've been talking to for quite some time who is frustrated by the fact that we can't agree about things. And I've told that individual, if you think that's frustrating when you and I talk, try coming to the Synod Assembly with me and watching hundreds of Lutherans from the same part of the country disagree on the punctuation of a resolution. Now before you chuckle at us, keep in mind that historically, the Jewish rabbis argued for several hundred years 
over whether eating food with false teeth violated the Sabbath commandment, because teeth were made of wood, and grinding food with wood was considered labor, and labor was prohibited on the Sabbath day. Therefore, if you eat food with wooden teeth, are you not violating the Sabbath day? We pick the dopiest things to make the basis for our argument. So, there are always differences of opinion. There always will be differences of opinion. And Paul writes to them and he says, I didn't come to you with eloquent words or fancy philosophies. I came knowing one thing, Jesus Christ and Him crucified. God has chosen the foolish of the world to save it. He has chosen what seems insignificant to be the messenger of the greatest gift of all, God's love. God has called us to proclaim that there are no programs or devices, no surveys or samples, <coughs> no methods of government or organization, no use of power or clever technology, no fundraising, no taxation, no order of worship or style of song that we sing will bring people to Jesus. The one provenly effective means is the sharing of one person whose life has been touched by Jesus and sharing that with another person. What God requires is that we act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.